morning. Hello, I'm Ben Mayfield. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, REMC, and I'm blessed and honored to be delivering the word. Uh, today, I, we follow a thing called the lectionary. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's basically you go through the Bible within three years. And so it, it helps pastors make sure we teach all of scripture, not just like some of our favorite verses. And so as a guy who's, you know, newly clergy for a couple of years, sometimes I get some lectionary verses. I'm like, all right, that one's kind of tough. That one's, how do I teach that? And how do I make a sermon out of that? It's only two verses, but okay. And so when I got asked to preach today, I was like, all right, what's the lectionary? And I have been blessed. So many years ago, in 2010, but for some of us, that's not too long ago. For some of us, it's probably the year we were born. I don't know. Uh, but in 2010, uh, I didn't grow up in church. I was a freshman in college, and I was coming to, to recognize that I wanted a relationship with the Lord. I was, uh, had a void in my heart. I was desperate, lonely, trying to figure out where my, my calling in life was. And I got plugged into a church in Dahlonega, Dahlonega UMC, and it was a blessing. That's where I met Jeff Ross, if you know Reverend Jeff. He's incredible. But I also met a youth pastor named Chris Davis. And Chris gave me uh, my first Bible. And he said, Ben, just pick a book and read it and decide, like, you know, uh, maybe afterwards we could discuss it and see what stood out to you. And so I did what every good college student does who gets their first Bible. And I went to the, one of the shortest books of the Bible because I didn't want to read it too long. And so I chose the book of James. If you don't know the book of James, it has five chapters. It's pretty manageable, okay. Some of the chapters or some of the books have longer chapters. In case you're wondering, I don't know. Everybody knows that, right? So five, I was like, I can do that. And I've been blessed because James was an incredibly impactful in my spiritual formation. And it's a controversial book of the Bible, right? And it's fantastic. And so when I looked at the lectionary, it was James chapter 1. So I was like, yes, I get to teach on a scripture that I just love and it's impactful. And so we start with verse 17 from chapter 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So this is 17 and 18 of James. And I, I wanted to come up with, a, what does that mean? What is a good bulletin point? What is a... The, the theme that James is trying to teach here. And it's the nature of God's good gifts. 17, 18, it's the nature of God's good gifts. That every good and perfect gift comes from God who is unchanging and consistent in his generosity. God's gifts are, are not just material blessings that so often we, we, we think of when it comes to blessings of money, popularity, uh, hardships that I don't have, right? We think those are blessings, but those are materialistic things. But rather the gifts that, that we talk about here are spiritual gifts and the gift of new life through the word of truth. So God's good gifts. The, God's unchanging nature, as, as James describes, is the father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. This underscores the reliability and consistency of God's goodness. In this season of life in 2010, but even today, it doesn't matter if I was a new believer or a believer for a long time, to think about the world that we live in, everything is so fragile, everything is so fleeting. But to think about God's unconditional love being consistent and reliable, not just on the, the high moments of the, of the peaks of the mountaintops, but also in the valleys where there's growth and there's learning, God's gift is consistent and reliable, always persistent. God's unchanging nature. And then we look at good gifts from God. Well, what are these gifts, these good and perfect gifts that God offers us? It includes wisdom. And we need God's wisdom in today's world. We also need his grace and salvation. And these gifts reflect God's compassionate character and his desire for our well-being. Grace, salvation, wisdom, these are God's gifts. Grace is this undeserved, unconditional love that he pours upon us. And when we receive these good gifts, uh, gifts the, the grace changes us. 
It transforms us from the inside out. And so when we, we, we think about this, is there's gifts of the world that may think that will give you value, that may think that will go fill up this void in your heart or heal some pain that you have, but it's all temporary or fleeting and it's never consistent or reliable. But God's good nature of grace and salvation saves us from where we are. It fills the abyss that is within us with love and mercy and forgiveness. And those are gifts from God, not things that we can produce on our own. And then the gift of new life where, where God emphasizes that he brought believers into new life through the message of truth, which should inspire gratitude in a transformed way of living. The gift of new life. We talk about that a lot in youth group, how we have the ability to speak life into others or to speak death into others and how we choose to speak life. But when you follow the Lord and, and you're thinking about this book of James and challenging us to follow God, that there's a new life, that you're dying to your old ways. I don't want to be like that anymore. And how do I live into a new life? So James starts us off real strong here with the nature of God's good gifts. And we continue in verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. And so James is counseling us believers to, to be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That they stress the importance of receiving the word of God with humility as it has the power to save and transform lives. And when you read this scripture, I, it's almost like uh, James is calling us out. It's, it's, it's like, hey, slow to speak, quick to listen. How many marriages and relationships would be improved if we were <laughs> quick to listen and slow to speak. I'm guilty of that as well. Friendships, workplace. And I think James is, is saying, hey, listen, when we do this, when we go into this uh, living out the word, we look at listening and speaking. And how it's important to, to quick to listen as is a means of fostering understanding and avoiding unnecessary conflicts. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we're called to love God and love people. And we're called to be in community, to be brothers and sisters. It doesn't mean we always have to agree. But can we be slow to, to voice our opinions and just listen to the hurt that other people are trying to speak and how we can listen to them? I think about this in a, in a way that is a, it's a little challenging. Is Have you ever had a conversation with someone and instead of listening to what that person is saying, you're already developing your response. Have you ever done that before? Where this person is saying something like, okay, they said one word, I'm now i got to come up with my response, and I'm writing it down, they're yapping, they're yapping. And when they're done yapping, you're like, here's my response. And we stop listening to what they were saying. Or have you ever felt that the person wasn't listening to what you were saying, and they were just developing a response? James knows that to live in community, we can't live this way. So how do we foster an understanding, a love, and a community bond. It takes humility. It takes humility in receiving the word. And it stresses how humility is crucial in accepting the teachings of Scripture. That the word of God should be welcomed with an attitude of openness and readiness to change. If you're talking about, well, Ben, how do I listen and how do I speak? You have to be humble in realizing that it's not about you. No one throw me anything. Okay, all right, that's good. All right, it's not about you. That's, we come to worship. We're not worshiping. And, and some of the comments we get as pastors, am I calling anybody out, is, well, I just didn't really feel it. It wasn't really for me. Well, the worship wasn't for you. The worship is for God. Glory be to God. And how we can open our hearts and worship God. And I think James is, is, is challenging us as new believers and deep believers and long believers of saying, hey, listen, if you're really going to try to change and listen to the word and, and be in community, you have to be humble to say, you know what, i got to put my ego 
in check. I got to put my pride in check and learn and be humble. I work with students. I don't know if you know, I'm the, I'm the student guy here. And with that, there's a, sometimes as the teacher, you're like, ah, I'm going to teach them. Ah. But any good teacher knows that the students often <laughs> teach you. And they teach me things each and every time I speak to them. And it's like, man, I could be the old man in the room. Like, well, you know, I got the wisdom because I, I got the teachings. I have the degrees. I have the, the age. I have the titles. Or do I go, you know what? That was a really cool perspective that I haven't thought about before. And thank you. There's this humility that other people can, can, can pour out because the spirit is speaking through them. And so are we going to have a posture of doing that? And if we do so, it creates a community that can come together and do some great things. Because it's the power of the word that has transformative power. That it's the word of God that's able to save and cleanse. That this transformation requires a deliberate effort. Or as my youth kids know, my favorite Christian word is, probably not, Intentional. This is deliberate, intentional. Intentionality is important. And I love that Christian word of intentionality. It's this intentional effort to put away moral filth or evil practices. And I don't know if you read the scripture, and I don't know if you're like me, but like you read evil practices. You're like, okay, well, I'm not evil. I'm not the Sith Lord over here. You know, I'm not Dr. Doom. You know, I'm not doing evil practices. All right, that's some nerdy references maybe for this section. Uh, I'm not some historical figure that's bad, okay? For those, I don't know. <laughs> I digress. But evil practices, when you read the scripture sometimes, it's like, that's not me, right? You don't associate with yourself with evil practices. At least I hope not. But what it's really trying to say is, are there things that you do that are against God? Are there things that you do that cause hurt or harm? Because if you do those things, that is inherently against God and perhaps evil. One of the things that I talk about a lot with, is it gossip or is it gospel? Right? Is what we're saying to people gossiping or is it about the gospel? If the person is not in the room, should we speak about them? Would their feelings be hurt if they were in the room and heard the words that you said about them? Not calling anybody out. But I have felt that way before when I've heard conversations about me through a third party. I said, man, that's, that's not true. I, I wish I was there to defend myself or it's hurtful that they think those things and, and I can't defend myself. And, and what James is saying is the power of the word, if we're truly being humble and letting the word transform us, some of those practices will be gone. They'll be eliminated or they'll be reduced. We got to work on it. Be intentional about, man, I got to control the tongue. And spoiler alert, chapter three talks about it. All right? How do we control ourselves and humble ourselves and listen to the power of the word? And James continues do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James 122, this is a memory verse. All right? This is one that I hope you yeah, imprint on your mind and you can remember it forever and always. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the word, by the world. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so right here, James is challenging us believers to not only hear the word, but to act upon it. 
Authentic faith is, is demonstrated through action, particularly in caring for orphans and widows and maintaining some personal integrity. So becoming a doer of the word emphasizes the, the difference between merely listening the word and actively applying it in daily life. And James uses this metaphor of a mirror and forgetting what one looks like to kind of illustrate this point. This one is, is one of the ones that makes it kind of controversial within the Christian world. Faith versus works. Faith versus works. And I, I go back to Matthew where the greatest commandment is to love God while your heart all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Amen? And what does he say after that? Uh, oh, so come on, crowd, preach it. L love your neighbors as yourself. Love thy neighbors. Love God, love people. And I think what he's saying is when we become doers of the word is, is to love our neighbor. And what does that look like? He says, don't forget that when you read this scripture, when you come to church, when you come to Bible study, when you experience the Lord in intimate ways, when you have this authentic faith, don't experience it and go, yes, Lord, this is great, and then immediately walk out those church doors and forget about it. Don't come in here and say, I'm going to choose the gospel versus the gospel. I'm going to choose to love people versus, you know, uh, bringing people down. I'm going to be uh, quick to listen and slow to anger. And then we walk out the doors and we forget about it. He's saying, let this word be transformative. Let it be intentional in your mind and your heart. And it's not easy. But we can go out and we can do it and be doers of the word. Have this transformative experience and go love Thy neighbors. But our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. And this is where in 2010 and even today it hypes me up because the world is broken. The world has people that want to tear you down. And they're looking for a light in the darkness. And as Jesus Christ dwells within us, the Holy Spirit dwells with us, we have that light within us. And can we go out into the darkness and shine the light of Jesus? Yes, we can. But yet often, and I'm guilty of this too, we walk out and we forget. We walk out and we're not intentional. We walk out and we get bogged down by the busyness of the world. And James says, please be, be doers of the world. Practice expressions of faith. Think about the actions for the vulnerable. Keeping oneself unstained from the world. Talks about looking for those who are lost. Practical expressions of faith, looking for those who are needing of love to be seen. One of the things that I, I've done for a couple years, I'm not going to preach about it today, but maybe that's a future sermon, was I had a vision from the Lord. I know, crazy, right? And we look at Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus looks at us as we are loved, valued, and known. And if Jesus looks at us that way, how can we help Look at that upon others. And that's the practical expressions of faith, is letting those know that they're loved, valued, and known. And the impact of, of living out this faith, these principles not only reflect one's faith, but serves as a witness to others, demonstrating the tangible impact of a life transformed by the word. These points offer a, a comprehensive view of, Jesus, uh, of how James encourages us believers to understand God's gifts, embody his teachings, and live out their faith in actual ways. And so I kind of did that so you can kind of see where I'm working in my mind. And I was thinking about this and I, what kind of story kind of talks about this faith going out. We went on a mission trip this summer to Puerto Rico. I don't know if we have a couple of Puerto Rico mission trippers here. Yeah, yeah we got Caden over here. We got one. Nice. All right, great. We went on this mission trip to, to Puerto Rico, and a lot of times when we talk about this, this um, authentic faith in action or living out the word or the nature of God's gifts, we talk about it, and it's difficult to go out and do it. We're on this mission trip, and we're in this school community center type thing, and we're putting on a VBS. And in that VBS, uh, there is a language barrier, a language barrier of we don't speak Spanish, and they do. And it's difficult. It's difficult to, to think about this. I'm like, all right, God's got good gifts. I'm, I'm trying to live out the word. I'm trying to be authentic. I want to be quick to listen. 
but I don't know what they're saying. I want to be slow to speak, but they're not going to understand whatever I say, even if it is slow. So what do I do? How do I, how do, I do this? And I think what's really cool is sometimes in your situations, in your life, it, you're saying, all right, Ben, I, I, I hear this word. I want to be doers of the word, but you don't understand my situation. It's more difficult or complex than maybe what you offer on a Sunday morning. And so I want to show you a demonstration of here we are trying to run a VBS, and we don't speak Spanish. And we have one or two translators, but they can't translate, you know, over 100 kids and all these helpers. We don't have a lot of translation. And so, I mean, to a point where kids were, were trying to speak to us, I remember this little kid, he was hilarious. He was like, like speak to me in Spanish. And I'm like, no habla española. And he like kept speaking. I'm like, uh-huh, muy bueno. Don't know what you're saying. And you can tell the kid's getting frustrated. He's like, ah. I feel like, and I don't know what he said, but he's probably like, stupid, stupid guy. He doesn't know what I'm saying. So he goes and gets an adult. <laughs> That translator and like a little kid is like, you know, dragging the, the adult over and it's like, hmm, <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> and was, his whole question was, who's my favorite superhero? And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, Wolverine. And he was like, okay, okay. And then like went, goes and walks away. And I was like, if I knew that's what he was asking, I could have said it. I didn't know. Um, and I just felt so kind of dumb and embarrassed that I couldn't understand what this kid's saying. But by the end of the week, all that to be said, by the end of the week, the students kept showing up, kept loving them, kept conquering the barriers that were in front of them. And when they said when we said goodbye, the students, about a hundred students, started bawling out crying. And our high school students, not Caden though, because he's strong, doesn't cry, start bawling out crying as well. And we're weeping, and we're weeping. And we're weeping. And at a certain point, we had to walk outside. And we get under this pavilion and we're circled up. The students don't know how to express how they're feeling. They don't know how to express the words of, of, of what's going on. And I said, the Holy Spirit transcended a language barrier. And through this experience, you were able to love so beautifully with the way that you acted, the way that you responded, the way that you were consistent, the way that you, um, you know, let the gifts of God shine through you with, with grace and love and patience, the way that you were listening and speaking, the way that you were humble, the way that you let the word of God transform you, the way that you were able to let God use you transcended any barrier that was in front of you. And what was crying was the overflow of the heart. That that week that they felt loved, they felt valued, they felt known. And so the encouragement that I have for you as the band comes back up is the book of James is about letting the Holy Spirit and his faith transform you. And looking at the barriers that may be in front of you and say, I know the Holy Spirit's got me through this. That I'm not going to forget about it at church, but I'm going to walk through those doors and let God's light shine through me. Because you have the capability to do so. We get this honor and blessing to do communion. And I'm really excited about it. Because as we talk about this James scripture. And we talk about you know, remembering the word and being doers of the word. To love God and to love people. We often need to be reminded of just how much. God truly loves us. And to do that, we do this thing called communion. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave thanks to his disciples and said, Drink from this. All of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of, of bread and wine, may them be for us the body and the blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit, make us with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. 
until Christ comes in final victory. God, we're thankful for this place of worship where we can come to you humbly and say, God, I, I don't know everything, I don't have everything figured out, but I'm seeking something greater than I. That God, that you come into this relationship with us, that you want to not leave us where we're at, but you'll meet us where we're at and you'll take us upon this journey. And this book of James is, is five chapters of challenging us to love God, be transformed by that love, and to love people. So God, there's people in our congregation today that need love. There's people outside these walls that need love and healing and mercy and forgiveness of, of whatever it may be. That shame and guilt and embarrassment have no power over you, God. That your dominion conquers those things. That those things often keep us out of relationship with others. And today we speak into life that they have no power or dominion over us, God. That your love reigns supreme. That healing takes place in those hearts that are hurting. For it's in Christ's name that we pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.